Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the WBK Ultra Podcast. And I want to talk about replacing hate, hatred in yourself with curiosity. And this is specifically towards people who you think may be antagonizing you. When I look back on my life and I think of one of my most tormenting moments, I was probably 24. It was in uh, Wisconsin, like Appleton, Wisconsin. I was in a mall. And I saw these people who were so happy, and I could tell they were they were idiots. Um, they were very unintelligent. They were poor. They were uh, nothing that I thought at the time was desirable. And yet they were happy. And at that same time, I was absolutely miserable. And so I hated them. I hated them because they were happy. I hated them because they had what I thought was unobtainable that I thought could only be achieved through uh, this bastardized view of virtue I had um, that was, you know, defined as being intelligent and being successful and being all these things that are very good to have and make your life way better. But they're not, when you intend for those things to occur, you kind of um, ignore the things you actually want and you may take shortcuts or whatever it is. And at the time I was just, I was chasing after these goals I had, but I wasn't acknowledging what I wanted to occur. I was just, okay, I'm going to make money. Well, why? Because I want money. But that, that's, a, that's a hollow, you know, that's a hollow, a hollow goal, I think. And so for these people, I saw them and they were having a fun time, you know, being idiots, but having fun. And um, I really did hate them. And I think if I had the mindset I had now, back then, I would have saved myself a lot of, uh, of turmoil, a lot of wrestling with who I am and myself and the things that I value and um, how they they fit into my priorities and my value system. I didn't have that perspective where I said, okay, I want to replace this hatred with, with curiosity. Why are they happy? And then just go down that line of thinking because um, I, I watched this, uh, this podcast with Daryl Davis the other day. Daryl Davis is a black guy from the South who converted like 200 uh, KKK white supremacists and other militant groups uh he converted them from their previous lifestyle towards uh towards a regular lifestyle someone who doesn't uh despise people because of their race which is very good but one of the things he said in that interview was that you can't he, he didn't know why they hated him he didn't get it he said how can you hate what you don't understand they don't know me how can they hate me and that really resonated with me um and it kind of brought me back to how I used to be. And I, I didn't hate people because they have their skin color, obviously. But I hated them because of things that you shouldn't hate someone for. Because they were happy. Because they were, uh, mostly because they were happy. Because they had a good relationship with their family. Because of things that I didn't have. And I thought I deserved. Or I thought should be given to me. You know, in the terms of a relationship with your family. Uh, I, I had this idea that uh, the default for a human being should be... A, B, C, and D, you know, all these positive attributes, you're happy, great family, you're in shape, you're not depressed, all this stuff. I thought that was the default when it's not really. Uh, the default for us is just floating in the, uh, in, the, in the midst of this cosmic sea. And I don't mean that in some sort of like new age uh, <laughs> energet, energetic woo woo uh, or woo way. <laughs> way. Uh, I mean this in the sense that there is not really any, there's no confines around us. There's no uh, absolute reason that says, okay, this is how things should be. This is how things shouldn't be. There's no, um, there's no sense of divinity or higher power or authority that says, okay, these things are right. And for me to assume that those would be uh, in place would, was, was just sort of giving up uh, an enormous sense of my autonomy and my independence and my ability to acknowledge things and look at them and examine them. And through examination, come to my own conclusions uh, based on my own value systems. I was just sort of taking these things for granted that everyone else had. Or rather, I thought they were taking them for granted. It was weird. I was projecting that sense of, oh, this is, you know, you just don't appreciate it. When in my own life, I wasn't trying to appreciate anything. I just wanted things to be given to me. And it's, um, it's not... I don't think it's necessarily anyone's fault to think that way because it's very easy if you're just trying to be comfortable and go with the flow and do what everyone else is doing 
to fall into those habits just to say, okay, I'm going to mimic the behavior of those around me without examining it. And for some people, that works out fine. It's not really... These things are not intrinsically bad, I don't think. They're not intrinsically good, but they're not destructive tendencies. To be lazy is not to be destructive, but it's also not to be productive. And so you're kind of in this middle, this, uh, you know, not good, not bad. And so what I would, what I was thinking is, okay, uh, what I would tell myself back then. I said, okay, why are they happy? Why are you, why do you hate them? And I think just asking myself those questions would have, if I took myself seriously, because obviously I could always, you know, uh, retort with some snarky comment or, or, or vitriol or whatever. Uh, but if I seriously acknowledged them back then, I would have said, okay, I hate them because I'm deeply unsatisfied with the way um, my life is in certain aspects. I'm deeply unsatisfied with how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And I see they have that. And not that I want to take it from them, but I don't think they deserve it because I had built into my mind this idea that work was what would, would bring you things. From a very young age, I was always told that work was, was what was important. Working was hard, and work has always been associated with this sort of, of, uh, of unhappiness. Whereas, you know, if you're, what's the opposite of working? It's playing, right? And playing is fun. And so working is not fun which I don't believe that anymore at all. I think that you, it's very, very easy to find things that you can uh, make money off of, that you can find fulfillment and that you can feel satisfied doing that aren't necessarily work, that you don't um, despise doing or you don't view as a punishment of sorts. But at the time, I didn't have that view. I just thought, okay, you work hard, you get there. It was a very, uh, it wasn't a nuanced understanding and it was more just taking things as, as how they were told to me. There was no no um, interpretation, no examination. And after I saw Daryl Davis say this, or listened to him say it, I began thinking, okay, how can I really take that idea and transpose it across my life in any way I can? You know, and, and what, what, what things am I doing where I'm not questioning my intentions, where I'm not examining my actions, and I'm just responding emotionally? I'm, uh, and not to say that it's only emotional responses that are bad, but I'm responding without examination. You're going to be uh, defaulting to either uh, like societal norms or your own emotions. And oftentimes they're going to be conflated too because I feel like in our society, in the United States at least, we have been um, moving towards this belief that all opinions are, are, are valid. All emotions are valid, no matter what it is. And if you feel it, there must be a valid reason for it. And I think that that's an absolutely uh, really limiting mindset. It's not going to necessarily harm you, but it's going to keep you from knowing what you really think. If you just accept how you feel as the truth, as divine, uh, as un unarguable, uh, then you have set a wall in front of you. You said, I will not go beyond this point because there is nothing beyond this point. And there's everything beyond that point. You know, that's, that's the unfortunate truth is that we, the only, the main limiting factor uh, in, a, in a country where, like the United States, where there's not, you know, an authoritarian military presence and there's not, you know, warfare in the streets. In a, in a um, when people are left to their own devices, the only limiting factor is the confines in which they establish around themselves, that they establish themselves in. The limits they put upon themselves are the only real limits um, in terms of things like, you know, uh, what do you want to accomplish, how happy are you, the kind of things that we associate more with like an, uh, an inner peace or a tranquility or, uh, you know, this feeling that everything is good, everything is okay. And not that everything is great and you're constantly happy and ecstatic, but that there's not uh, this pernicious, destructive nature creeping in around you, which was the way I felt for a long time. And I think that that was because I was, intentionally or not, I was setting up these parameters around myself for what I thought I had to be. And I wasn't examining them. They were there, I put them there, or I allowed them to get put there by other people. But I wasn't questioning them. And I think the reason I wasn't questioning them was because I didn't really believe in myself. I didn't believe that the answer I would come to would be 
credible. I didn't believe that the answer I would, ex you know, through this examination, what I would, what I would come to and, and realize was, uh, for me at least, you know, not the truth, I guess, but just correct, true, right. I couldn't do that. And I think that if you replace the hatred in your life with curiosity, because hatred is a very, I think it's a very destructive emotion. Not many things are created out of hate. I'm sure there's a lot of good, good songs or music or, or art that's been created out of, out of immense uh, pain. But I think hatred is, is the, the, uh, the projection of that onto someone else. It's not the feeling inside of you, really. It's the projection of that into someone else. You are filled with hate towards someone. You hate things. You are angry. You can be angry. You can be, you can be uh, immensely troubled. Um, but that isn't necessarily going to uh, equate to hate. And so by replacing the hate towards other with curiosity for their intentions, for your own intentions towards them, it allows you to examine these emotions and through examination, I think that you could understand what the real problem is. Like, like what I just told you, it's been 10 minutes. And I've already, I think, explained why I felt that way in relatively clear terms. And when I say it like this, it seems um, almost simple, like something a child would say. And because of that, I almost, I'm questioning myself again right now. Should I post this? Will I appear uh, like, a, like a child, infantile, naive? And I don't want to appear that way because, well, one, I don't want to be perceived that way, which is, again, myself putting this uh, validation on others, saying, hey, am I good enough? One, what I should be doing is examining my actions and saying, yes, they are good enough. Yes, putting this video out there is constructive in a way that it allows others who may have felt the same way as you to have this sort of structure and support and guidance that you lacked younger in your life. And not to say that I know everything, because I, I don't. I know, I know nothing at all. I can only tell you uh, for certain what my feelings were. That's really all I can, I can guarantee is how I felt then, how I felt now, and the actions I took to uh, facilitate that change. Because um, you're really going to be always changing, aren't you? You have to be always changing. There's this, I, I was talking to a friend of mine about what, what change is, and I said, is it really okay to call it change? She was saying change is inevitable. Change is constant. And I, I, that kind of lumps it into, a one, into one thing, I think. This idea of change, and almost, it, it, it says, okay, change is this, and we've defined it, and now we can separate it from us, and it's just this thing that happens. Whereas change, uh, in reality, occurs in a multitude of ways. There can be growth, there can be decay, there can just be uh, drift around you. It's not fair just to call it change. There's change in directions. And so I can say, I changed in this way. Did I just get older? Do I feel the same, but my body is weaker, but my mind is weaker? Or did I acknowledge what was around me, how I felt, how my body is, how my mind is, and uh, take steps to, again, facilitate that positive change? I've been thinking about how this affects my business. How does this, um, you know, hatred towards things and not a curiosity towards things, how does that affect my business? Because that's, you know, important. I think that um, everyone should have their own way of making money. And for me, it's this business right here. And I love doing this. But if I'm not examining it and questioning it, questioning it am I really doing my best job? Am I really living intentionally? Am I really saying, okay, these are my goals. Here is how I can obtain them, and here are the actions I can perform with intention that will hopefully reach those goals. Um, am I curious about, about new options, new opportunities, or do I hate myself for making bad investments? So in terms of all this clutter in my warehouse, uh, I actually have cleaned up this space right here. So it's clean here, but on this side of my warehouse, there's pallets and boxes, and it's very messy. And... I avoided doing the math on how much money this space cost me because I hated the idea that I had made a mistake, that I had done things that were stupid. Because if I did stupid things, then I'm a stupid person. And that was that mattered so much to me not to be stupid. So I just ignored them. I just said, okay, it'll stay there. And there are things I told myself that aren't lies. 
you know, they're true. Oh, it has value still. Oh, it does have value still. Oh, well, I don't need the space. I don't need the space. But I wasn't producing anything. I, was, I wasn't being destructive, but I was being complacent. I was being complacent in the sense that I, I was ignoring things that could help my internal productivity for the sake of protecting my ego. And a lot of people do that. You can be at, at any level of success and still do that. It's not this kind of thing that you're born thinking. It's a mindset you fall back into where maybe you, you stop considering. Maybe things are good for a while. And so you're no longer panicking. You're not frantic. And you're just kind of falling into these routines and these ruts. And these routines, I shouldn't call them ruts yet because a, a rut is just a routine that has not been examined. Any routine with examination and action, that can't be a rut because it's not going to be constantly uh, repeated ad nauseum. It's going to be the kind of thing that you're saying, oh, is this the best way to get to the point A? Or is this the best way to get to point A? If you're constantly examining and changing the route, then no rut can be made. And of course you might say, oh, but what if I have everything perfect? And if you have things perfect, then obviously you've examined them. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm trying to say is that these the metaphors break down, the analogies break down. They're oftentimes just used to convey um, an individual point. You know, uh, if you're reading a paper, you're reading one line of that paper. I want to convey that one line without regard for the rest of it, because sometimes uh, focusing on one aspect makes the entire lesson easier to digest. So, yes, the analogies break down. But the underlying principle that knowing what you're doing, examining the things you do, is not going to have detrimental effects towards the end goal that you want to accomplish. Now, it might make you feel bad. It might make you confront things about yourself that you don't want to confront because it, it shakes your base. It questions who you are. And if you're someone like me who is ferociously independent, to question who you are, uh, when you feel already like you're kind of isolated can be scary, can be very, very scary because who is there around you uh, to catch you when you fall if you find yourself at massive flaw, massive fault? And the answer to that is, do you need to be caught? And the answer is no. The emotions you feel, the, the, the self-loathing, the, the feelings of inadequacy, whatever they are, they're not going to dictate your future self. They are representative of your past actions. Uh, and your past choices do dictate where you are now, but your past intentions don't dictate your future intentions or your present intentions. That's why we want to differentiate intentions from what's actually being said. Because what occurs around us in the physical world, how others act to us, natural disasters, weather, even to an extent, uh, medical conditions, depression, maybe you have cancer, those things you can't necessarily control them. You can do things to mitigate them or to hope they don't occur. But if a meteor, an asteroid, a, mete a meteor hits the earth and kills us all, what could I do? What can you do? We can hope it won't happen, but it's so outside of our ability to enact change. So we, we can't change it that um, it's almost one of the things, you know, it's just a, a companion to us in the universe. It exists the way we exist. It can't, you know, we can't make it, we can't give it consciousness and have it fly away. Uh, and then contrary to that are the, the thoughts inside your head. And maybe you can't control the thoughts inside your head. You can't say, I don't want to, you know, if you're someone who has a self-loathing attitude because you're so fat. You can't stop yourself from thinking, I'm so fat. I'm so fat. Uh, and you can't stop yourself from thinking, if I go to the gym, people are going to judge me and say I'm so worthless and fat, and they're going to think it, that I shouldn't even be here, and I should, just, I should just stay at home and eat until I die. You can have those thoughts, and there's nothing you can do about it. But what you can do is, do you fixate on them? Do you let them pass through you? Or do you let them dictate your life? Do you let them control you? Do you let your thoughts control you? Or do you control the way that you engage with your thoughts? And I think the answer is very clear. And I think when you think about it like that, I want to now swap it over to my inventory problem, my clutter problem. I'm very messy. Why am I messy? 
because I don't want to deal with thinking about why I have these things. I made mistakes buying them. I shouldn't have bought all those DVDs. Right now, I've got, uh, let's see, about 2,000 dud DVDs. So I still I made four and a half thousand dollars selling them last month. But my duds, I've got about 2,000 duds. And I'm holding on to them because throwing them away means I have to acknowledge that I could not find a better way to sell them. It's acknowledging my limitations, which again, seems so silly to say out loud because we all have limitations. We all do. We're not, we're not angels, you know, flying around with, with, uh, hypersonic tritons that can do all our bidding. There's no magic. I'm not Harry Potter. I can't do these things to, to, uh, remove the, the mortal aspects of my life that are so confounding sometimes. And so even with something as abstract as what I just talked about with, you know, this, this idea of letting your emotions pass through you, you can apply that to business uh, very easily. I can apply this to my inventory, to the way that I handle even business ideas. If I, I have several businesses that are making a small amount of money, not nearly as much as the time I spend putting into them is worth in other businesses. I could make more money uh, writing books than I could, uh, for example, writing content on a blog that I have about candy. You know, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where only reason I'm doing it is because I committed to it. And I can't let go because if I let go, then I have to examine why I held on for so long. And that just opens up this box of worms. I don't know who sells boxes of worms, but they've got one with my name on it. And I have to dig through there. You know, I have to suck it up and dig through those worms and, uh, and figure out why the hell they got sent to me. And they, you know, this is again where the analogy breaks down. But you get what I'm saying. You understand what I'm saying. I hope, I hope I'm very clear in this and that what you did in the past, although it may affect your present, does not infect the way you think, the way you perceive things, the way your mind works. You have control of what goes on in here to an extent. And if you don't utilize that control as much as you can, you're leaving a little bit of, you know, a little bit of fat in the table. You're leaving a little bit of money out there. You're leaving things that could be yours. You're imposing limits on yourself to protect yourself, to protect your ego. There's a million ways you can describe this. You know, every every different school of thought. You know, whether it's Eastern uh, mysticism or whether it's you know this idea of uh, of, of the ego in like Freudian, um, you know, Freudian terms. We all have this idea of of ourself, and our self should not be um, protected. You know, for for our for emotional sake. Obviously, self preservation is very important. If you're dead, you're gone. But our emotions, that idea, our emotional self. That is not what should dictate our actions, our intentions. The fear of being, uh, of coming to terms with your flaws, of coming to terms with the mistakes you've made, that should not dictate your future actions because at that point you're just in a cycle. You're in a rut. You're in a rut. You're going the same way over and over again. And as you go that way, as you make those synaptic connections in your brain as you dig that that ditch you're walking along as you walk along the path and your feet make indentations you get a little bit deeper the synaptic pathways get a little bit harder to get out of uh, imagine if you have something soft um you know like like a, a a floor of mattresses and every day you roll the bowling ball across those mattresses it would get easier to roll the bowling ball wouldn't it it would get easier there would be a divot formed and uh, the bowling ball would be predictable, but it would get deeper and deeper, and it would become almost impossible from that same release point to have the bowling ball go anywhere but down that same path. And if that path is built on, on protecting yourself from growth because growth is scary, where are you going to be? You're going to be in the same place, and we don't want that. All right, guys, that's the video. Thank you so much for watching. It's a podcast, too. It's on Spotify, Apple, whatever, all that stuff. Please subscribe to the podcast. Give the video a thumbs up. Leave a comment below with how this impacted you. I want to know your opinion on this. Am I? Do you think that I'm a crazy person? 
you know, ask me questions and I'll ask you questions. And through that examination, through that curiosity, hopefully we can find what I'm trying to really say, what you're trying to really say. And, and in that conversation, the things that mean, the things that matter to us. Don't be a shithead either. <laughs> Don't be a shithead, guys. I'll see you later.